welcome, um, welcome everyone uh, to Digital North, um, serverless or server more. We've got three speakers today. Uh, so we've got Bob Gregory uh, from Kazoo. Um, Bob's got best part of 20 years experience, Bob, mostly in, uh, mostly in startups. Uh, I think you spent the last 10 years or so as an architect, uh, mostly working in event-driven architecture and microservices. Um, I know you told me about what you like to do in your spare time, so bonsai. Um, which is pretty cool. Uh, he liked playing Go now, stupidly, and I don't know why I thought this. I, I thought he was referring to Pokemon Go. Turns out it's a highly intellectual game, which obviously I didn't know of, that I wasn't aware of. Um, but I've looked into it, looks really, really interesting. Aside from that, Bob, uh, you're a bit of a boring middle aged man, apparently, with kids who live out in the suburbs. <laughs> is yeah, that about days. right? It's pretty much true these days, yeah. Too old now for raving and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, welcome to the event, buddy. And obviously, you know, you're going to be our first talker for the evening. Um, so thanks for joining us. Um, secondly, we've got Mark Quinn. Uh, Mark, I've had the pleasure of um, knowing now for what best part of three years. Um, one of the most down to earth. <laughs> one of the most down to earth technologists that I know uh, in Manchester. Uh, most of your experience has been financial services, consultancy, uh, and startups. Um, highly skilled in .NET, JavaScript frameworks. AWS and you know you guessed it serverless right so um, it's a shame because I can't get my presentation slides up um, but I did have a little gag for him but I'm going to have to leave it which is really really frustrating um, so you've got away with that one buddy how are you doing you okay yeah great man good man good man and then finally but by no means least we've got Adrian Adrian Heskiff from Infinity Works how are you doing Adrian how are you doing <laughs> oh, good, mate. Thank you. So, uh, Adrian started the Infinity Works Manchester office uh, around three years ago now. Uh, he's got a team of over 50 engineers um, currently helping businesses and companies to adopt serverless uh, in their teams uh, and to deliver new products uh, and services. So, I think you've got roughly four years' experience in delivering serverless solutions, mostly AWS. Um, and I believe today That's you're going to be talking about. The container in the last couple of years. That's it. So, and I believe your talk today is going to be about the future of serverless, which I've been reliably informed is a, an interesting chat. So we're certainly looking forward to that, Adrian. Um, so I'm sure people here haven't come to listen to me and look at my blue cloud behind me. So I'd like to pass over to Bob um, for our first talk. Bob, over to you. Hurrah. Okay. Hello, everybody. I am Bob. I am a software architect. I currently work for a company called Kazoo. Um, we sell cars online. It's all... Um, very boring. Um, you can find me on Twitter um, if you want to argue with me about something, or you can find the slides on github.com slash Bob the Mighty. Um, I can't see you whilst I'm talking, so if there's like a problem, if you're on fire or you have a desperate question, um, ping someone, I'm sure they'll use their voices. Um, I want to talk today about um, how we build complex systems from small pieces. Um, I think the advertised title of my talk is Serverless Makes It Easy, which is a proposition that I don't actually agree with, um, because I think that moving towards serverless will make things harder for you, at least in the short term, because you have to think again about how you architect systems and you have to hire people who know how to build serverless or train them, and that takes time and money. But it will work out for you, I think, in the long term, because it means we can build more complex systems in a less complicated way. Um, so I need to talk about what we mean by complex, because complex and complicated are often used as synonyms for each other. But I think they do have different meanings and that the difference is important in the context of software engineering. So a complex thing is a thing that comprises many interrelated parts. Okay, So a complex thing has lots of parts and those things have uh, connections between them. They're interrelated and interwoven and interlocking so that the behavior of a complex thing comes from the relationships between the parts. Um, in mathematics, a complex system is one where we can't infer the behavior of that system from the surface characteristics. Right? So a complex system can be something very large, like the Earth's climate, or it can be something apparently trivial, like Conway's game of life. A simple thing by uh, comparison has very few parts and the behavior is obvious from those characteristics okay so a hammer is a simple machine right it's difficult to get much simpler than a hammer because it is literally a lump of metal on the end of a stick 
the complex machine might be the Antikythera mechanism. So this is a reproduction, but they found the original one of these buried in the sediment off uh, some Greek island. It is a Greek computer. It was built by the ancient Greeks 2000 years ago and it forecasts the movements of the planets and it forecasts solar eclipses and lunar eclipses by these clever interactions between different cogs. Right? If I were out walking and I found the head of a hammer by itself, I could probably immediately understand what it is. Even if I'd never seen a hammer before, I could look at it and say, oh, here's a heavy lump of metal with which I could bash other objects. But if I found a single cog from the Antikythera mechanism, I would have no real uh, way to apprehend the function of the machine that used to include it, right? Because the, the behavior is entirely, uh, entirely comprised of the interrelations between these things. So what's complicated? Um, so I think it's complicated, has lots of parts, but it's hard to understand. And complications are usually imposed from the outside. Okay? So a complex thing, like the Antikythera mechanism or a watch, is complex because of what it is. But a complicated thing is usually complicated because people got involved and made it complicated. Okay? Chess is a complicated game. So in chess, you've got like these six different pieces and they all move in different ways and pawns get like to move an extra space on their first turn because why not? And there's the weird castling thing where like the king can teleport across the board to his castle. And the thing about chess is you could change any one of those rules. So you could say, oh, actually, I'm just going to swap the bishop and the knight over. Or you could say that the pawns all move like rooks so that the opening phase is just a series of mad suicidal charges across the board. And it would still recognizably be chess. Um, the strategy might be different, but it would still be chess. And that's because the rules of chess are arbitrary and complicated. By comparison, Go is a complex game. So in Go, players take turns to put stones on a board anywhere they like. And if your stones are completely surrounded, then they're captured. And you're not allowed to return the board to its previous state so that we don't get like infinite cycles. And at the end of the game, the person who's got the most stones on the board, plus the ones they've captured, is the winner. It's that simple. There's some like there's some you know, finer points for. Uh, anyone out there who does play Go, that's basically it. And you can't change any one of those rules without destroying the game. Okay? You can't say that stones can move around, or that you've got three players, or that everyone moves simultaneously, or that you can't capture, because then the game will no longer be Go. And that's the difference, right? Is that, that complexity is essential to what the game is, rather than arbitrary and complicated. Why am I going about complexity? So people tell us that we should try and avoid complexity. Right? They say, you know, complexity is a bad thing. We should try and make systems simple, not complex. But I've found that in my experience that complexity has to go somewhere. Um, so I wrote a book about this, uh, where we talk about how to build systems that exhibit complex behavior uh, from small parts. And at the time I wrote this, I was working with my co-author, Harry, who is wonderful. Uh, we were working together for a company called Made.com and they make furniture online and they sell it online. And I want to give an example of a complex thing. So when you go to Made's website and you want to buy a lamp and two cushions and an armchair, we have to arrange for someone to bring those to your house and we have to charge you money for that privilege. Right? And that sounds easy, but it turns out to be really complicated. And that's because shipping things is complicated, okay? So small things like spoons or forks or mugs, it's cheap to send them with the post office, with Royal Mail, but Royal Mail won't touch things like lamps or armchairs. And then for medium sized things, you need to get someone like Parcel Force and they'll take you know, like lamps and they'll take forks, but they also won't take armchairs because they're too heavy and you need two people to lift them. And some medium sized things like curtain rails are really long and skinny, so parcel force won't touch those at all, but they can't really go with the two man company either, so you need a different courier. And then you've got the whole complication of like this one can go out on Monday and can go out Thursday, and it's all really complicated and horrible. And you can't solve this problem with a hammer. Okay, this is not a problem that is amenable to hammering. You need an Antikythera mechanism. And when I first started at made.com, there was a guy uh, who worked there. Uh, we'll call him Paul because that was his name. And Paul's job was every day he would look at a spreadsheet that contained all the things that customers had bought. And he would try and solve this logic puzzle. Right? He would apply his powers of reasoning 
and his experience to figure out how many trucks do we need to order from Royal Mail and from DHL and from Parcel Force and from the two-man delivery company in order to deliver all of this stuff. That was his job. The trouble is that you can't scale Paul because there's only one of him and he's only got so much reasoning he can do in one day. And so eventually you have to put the complexity back into a computer so that instead of selling 100 items a day, you can send, sell a million. And you can model this complexity by composing simple things, right? So we use a design pattern called the specification pattern. It looks a little bit like this, where we had rules and we said, you know, like we have a longer than rule. We could say something is longer than meet one meter or something is heavier than five kilograms. And then with the specification pattern, you can combine those rules. So we could have more complex rules like can ship with post office, where we say the post office can take things that are smaller than 30 centimeters long and weigh less than five kilograms and aren't explosive and don't contain human body parts and so on. And we can then compose those things. We could say, you know, if you can ship the whole basket with the post office or none of the items require two man delivery, then we can send it with the uh, parcel force. Okay, so we can take these small pieces of functionality, and we can compose them together to make something that that exhibits arbitrarily complex behavior. Okay, and I think that this is the essence of software engineering. You want to be able to uh, provide complex behavior without incurring too much complication. So why am I talking about this at a serverless conference? Well, it's because the trouble with my nice, clean, clever code is at some point I have to deploy it. Okay, we have to take it to production and production is where concepts go to die because this simple application with its clever code and its unit tests and its domain model and its fancy domain driven design and all that good stuff needed to run inside a web server. So we hosted it inside Flask, but Flask sucks when you have lots of connections. So we had to run that behind Nginx. So we put Nginx inside a Docker image that shipped with Alpine. And Alpine's great, but we had some problems with dependencies, which meant we had to run our own Alpine repository for packages. We had a Docker registry for the image, and we built that with Jenkins. And then we deployed that to an auto-scaling group of machines that ran console and vault. And we orchestrated that with Ansible Tower. And then we had like a Fabio thing going on so we could route all of the traffic inside of VPC, inside AWS. And every last piece of that is a complication. Okay, every last piece of that is unwelcome nonsense because the only thing I actually cared about was this little green box. Okay, the thing I actually wanted to build looked far more like this. So one of the techniques we can use for composing systems, okay, what we want to do is we want to try and get back to this where we have small pieces of code that we can compose together. And one of the ways I've tried to do that over the last decade or so is event-driven architecture. Because in an event-driven architecture, we build small objects that handle a message. So we build these small pieces of code, these little bits, and we connect them together using events. And an event is just a bit of data, okay? It's like a, it might be a JSON blob or an XML blob or protobuf or whatever. And a publisher does some work and it sends out an event into the world and then these consumers pick it up. And the important characteristic is that the producer doesn't know anything about the consumers. What this means is that each one of these pieces can be locally very simple, but the, the the overall system can exhibit this complex behavior that we care about. And when I first did this, uh, many years ago, back in you know, my .NET days, we used to use RabbitMQ to move events around, but it turns out that RabbitMQ is hard to distribute across data centers, okay? It works really well if all of your servers are together on the same rack in the same data center, but it's 2020 and everyone runs in the cloud. And trying to run a highly available uh, topology of RabbitMQ nodes in the cloud is really, really complicated, okay? Because you don't want to have a split brain outage on your messaging infrastructure, because that will be very bad and you will have a very bad time. And this helpful diagram shows you how to run a federated cluster of RabbitMQ machines. And I think it is objectively beautiful, but also it is complicated bollocks just to make that really simple producer consumer topology work, right? These days I run EventBridge. And EventBridge is a messaging platform from AWS built for just this kind of uh, publish subscribe architecture. And I actually have a crush on it. Um, because it solves a really complicated problem, which is moving messages around in a scalable fault tolerant way. And it does so by presenting a very simple and straightforward interface. 
So a typical use case might be, for example, that when your delivery service with its fancy rules figures out how best to deliver your chaise long and your poof, um, it needs to tell the guys at the warehouse what to do. And this turns out to be complicated, as everything is, because your UK warehouse wants you to send them CSV files over an FTP server connection. And your French warehouse wants, them, wants you to send them some kind of SOAP message to an API. And so you need a warehouse service in the middle that can, that can translate the instructions from the delivery service into these distinct domain languages for your different warehouses, right? Using events means we can keep these things separate so that each piece is locally simple. So with EventBridge, we connect our delivery system and our warehouse system with a rule that looks like this. And it says, anytime you see a delivery method calculated event that comes from my delivery service, just let me know and I'll do my piece of work. So everything stays nice and loosely coupled and very simple. Using EventBridge, we can do more interesting things though, right? Because we can also match on the content of a message. So actually we could say, if you see a delivery method calculated event, and the delivery country is France, then tell me the French warehouse service. And now my UK warehouse service just knows about CSV and FTP. My French warehouse service just knows about XML and SSL. My delivery system doesn't know about either of those things. Now all of these pieces are individually very small and simple, but the overall complex behavior is observed in the system. And EventBridge supports scheduled events, right? So I can use it to trigger an event every day or every five minutes. And I see teams quite regularly that deploy an entire server or even like a cluster of servers just to do cron. Nowadays, I don't have to care about any of that because I can just treat cron as a thing that is ambiently available to me serverlessly. So I can just take my little green box of code that I care about and run it on a schedule and not have to care about any infrastructure at all. So one more example, and I'm done rambling about complexity. Um, I've been a software engineer for about 20 years, and for almost all of that, I have been building web applications of one stripe or another. And one of the jobs I hate the most is uploading files. And that's because it seems like it's going to be such a simple thing, right? You upload a file, and then it turns out to be a complete pain in the backside, because there are all of these complicating factors, right? Like HTTP requests time out, so you need to be able to retry things, but then you want to be able to resume halfway through an upload, so you need to chunk it. What does that mean if you end up retrying on a different server? And do you then need to put all this stuff on one server, but then like, once well, you run out of disk space and the whole thing is just horrible and complicated, it makes me very sad. Just talking about it is giving me like flashbacks. Yeah, stuff, things that can happen, bad things can happen, right? Like we don't want to care about any of this stuff. We can think about this serverlessly, right? If we approach this problem serverlessly, um, we can start off because actually I'm just going to run API Gateway. And that means I can delegate all the questions about load balancing and authentication and all that rubbish to this piece of infrastructure, this gray box I don't care about. It's just a piece of infrastructure that I can adopt and just plug and play. So straight away, we can sidestep a whole bunch of complicated nonsense. We're going to call this API that's on the API gateway. We're going to ask it to talk to S3 on our behalf. What it's going to do is it's going to get a pre-signed link, okay? So this API is going to talk to S3 and say, please, can I have a URI that I can give back to my user? And that URI will allow us to upload exactly one file to this S3 bucket. So our plucky user can upload their file straight into the bucket, and they get to use the officially supported uh, libraries to do so. So we get things like splitting large files out of the box. And if we need to store attributes with our file, like the name of the author or some kind of version information, we can include user metadata in that original pre-signed link. So it gets baked into the file in S3. When the upload is finished, we're going to fire an event bridge event via CloudTrail. And that's going to trigger this event, this update Lambda thing that just sticks something into Dynamo. So, so far, the only things I care about are getting hold of a link and updating the database. Lastly, when we write into this Dynamo table, we can run a consumer on a Dynamo stream that can then do whatever extra processing we want, right? It can go and create thumbnails or scan for viruses, whatever it might be. And when it's done, it can call another Lambda over here that will then talk to API Gateway and I can notify my user through a WebSocket. Right? So I've got this whole thing where my user fetches a URI, we upload to S3, then asynchronously after processing, I can come back and I can tell the user. Now this is a complex system. Okay, this is absolutely a very complex system, but the only things I actually need to care about and deploy are these small 
four green boxes that do just the things that I actually care about, right? These are things that I actually want to be implementing. So the thing about serverless, I guess, my uh, TLDR, is that serverless allows us to build more complex systems to handle complicated real-world cases without incurring so much infrastructural complication. Thank you very much. Uh, also, we're hiring. You should definitely come and work at Kazoo because it's a riot and uh, there's lots of serverless things. And get a chance to work with you, right? Well, yeah, I suppose. Uh, if, that's a, if that's a positive thing rather than, rather than a, a horrifying notion. I just wouldn't play you at go. That's the only thing. Um, thank you for that, Bob. Extremely insightful. Um, we have got one question here. Uh, Adrian, is that you? Let's ping that in there. You're on mute, mate, if you want to ask the question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a question. It's just, uh, it's just like a... Uh, just saying like if you use Amazon Cognito you, uh, with an identity pool, you can even skip that, uh, getting your own upload URI and get the, uh, get the pre-signed URL directly from the S3 API and save yourself some money. There save you yourself go. one Lambda call. Every penny nice. counts. Yeah, it's true. It's not just it's every bit of infrastructure counts, right? But don't bother with an API gateway, then just you know, don't deploy the thing. Lovely. Right, we'll give, uh, we'll give the people a few more seconds see if they if they have any more questions. Um, by the way, I have those exact cushions that you had on that slide, Bob. <laughs> the orange cushions that were on your slide from me.com. It's quite weird. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. All right, all right Bob. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions coming through, mate, but um, I'm sure there'll be some towards the end. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. Um, Mark, should we move yes. on to you, buddy? Let's do it. Over to uh... you. Share my screen. This one. Oh God! You having tech problems as well? Well, I haven't used. Uh, you know, you'll end up able to record it kind of thing there. You're gonna have to leave uh, the call and come back, aren't you? Is that is that a thing? Yeah, I haven't used Zoom on my Mac yet. Yeah, the first time you use it uh, with the new Mac OS, you've got to. Um, Give it permission oh. for the first time you try and do it. Oh no, I can see. Is something. it working? Yeah. Have we got it? You are real. We can see it. Awesome. Right. Um, okay. So Mojo's journey to serverless. Pretty obvious. What I'm going to speak about. Um, this is pretty much a real world example of a business that was very much orientated around servers. Um, all of their code was hosted on actual physical servers that they had to worry about and care about um, and sort of a journey to getting away from that and becoming mostly serverless um, not entirely but I'll sort of get onto that in a bit um, so yeah Mojo I mean who are we we are an online digital mortgage broker um, I suppose we're trying to change a very unchanged industry mortgage industry hasn't changed really for about 50 years and it needs to be brought into the 21st century and that's very much what we're about um, we are apparently the best mortgage broker because they give out awards for that sort of thing these days. Um, so yeah, we're not hiring at the moment, but we will be quite soon. So yeah, keep your eyes open. Um, okay, so why why bother with all the effort? Um, obviously, Bob touched quite a bit on you know the, the technical reasons and and complications are quite a big thing. Um, I suppose this is kind of coming from a from a bit more of a softer approach. Um, why should we bother with all this effort? Um, I suppose the first thing is I am a tight arch. That's actually a recent picture of me, by the way. Um, I do love spending money on Amazon, my own money, and buying endless amount of crap from them. But when it comes to infrastructure, I don't want to give them any money. So I like to run things as cheap as, as possible, basically. Um, and to kind of, I suppose, give an example of that, January last year, um, per month, we were spending around $4,795, well, not around exactly, um, per month. Um, that was whenever we were sort of on a more server-based approach. Uh, I have sort of estimated based on the amount of things that we kind of have now, the amount of applications, we'd probably be spending in around 12000 a month uh, at the minute on infrastructure. And the reality is that today we're spending in around 3,900 a month. So we've actually managed to reduce our infrastructure costs, um, but built more stuff, which is pretty cool. And a lot of that's been through serverless. Um, 
again, yeah, developer experience. I mean, this is quite a debated topic these days. It's it's quite quite a talked about thing. Um, you know that you know Bob touched on a little bit. You know, you've wrote some code and you want to get it into production. How does that happen? And obviously, developers want that to be nice and easy as possible. Um, you know, working with a server and having to create a Docker file and then deploy it, it's actually quite slow and cumbersome and complicated. And that is not really the case in a serverless application. Um, it's, it's very, very easy to get your code into um, production, test, stage, and whatever you want to. And it's very, very quick to sort of have it hosted somewhere and actually get sort of direct feedback. And that's um, a huge thing for developers and companies as a whole, because obviously it just naturally speeds things up. We'll kind of talk a little bit in a bit about how you can sort of do that. Um, scale, I mean, I suppose every startup, you know, always dreams of that day that the sort of miracle happens and next thing, kaboom, you've got a million and one customers coming to your website every day. Um, and, you know, as technologists, we've, we've got to prepare ourselves for that. We've got to make sure that our software is there and it's ready to scale to that. You know, Mojo, for example, literally overnight could have tenfold the number of customers um, that we did the previous day. So it's quite important that we can scale with that. Um, and obviously on a server based approach, you know, to, to Bob's, you know, diagram, you're going to have to have add another server. You're going to have to have load balancers distributing the requests out and making sure that actually they're handling it properly. And you might be able to do a little bit of auto scaling, but when do you need to auto scale? Um, is that at 60%? Is it 70%? Just lots of things that you have to care about that you really, really shouldn't have to. Um, you know, with serverless, I suppose uh, I'm speaking specifically here about Lambda, we horizontally scale automatically. You know, it just, when something happens and my code needs to run, Lambda just determines that, okay, I need to run this somewhere. I'm going to run it over here and that's it. We don't need to care about it. And um, so scale is just kind of natural um, and comes very, very easily, which is obviously one less thing that we have to care about. Um, and ultimately means we can spend more time just writing code. Staying modern, this is the greatest meme ever. And unfortunately, I'm actually starting to look a little bit like it. Um, but yeah, we, um, we need to stay modern. I think, you know, I'm not talking about, let's just jump on the next bandwagon that comes across or whatever Medium article we've read the night before um, is now the thing that we're going to do. But we don't all want to be sitting here in five years time working on the same legacy apps, applications that we have been for uh, quite a while and you know when we get to that point it gets harder and harder to change we get slower and ultimately we're probably going to have to rebuild so the more you can sort of stay on the tech curve the easier things will naturally be for you as you move along um and obviously serverless is very much one of those modern things that is uh, talked about quite a bit these days so we probably want to hang around on that um as well as that everyone full stack i suppose this is a little bit more of a technology choice than infrastructure but at the time mojo was very very separated in terms of we have front-end developers and we have back-end developers front-end developers very much being javascript based people that you know did react back-end developers predominantly being net orientated um i kind of wanted to remove that barrier and an obvious way to do that is kind of node.js that's a great way to sort of introduce .NET developers to javascript and react developers already do javascript so why not write some server-side code now, how does that relate to serverless? Well, you could argue that, yes, I can do Node.js, I can write an express server and I can run it somewhere. Um, but actually getting your head around that concept of server, API requests, routing, all of that is much more complicated than just thinking about the fact that you've got an event and an entry point that's gonna run some code. So for someone that's not very used to running server side or building server side code, I think Lambda is a much easier um, approach to, to getting there. And we sort of proved that, you know, quite a lot of our front-end developers started developing server-side code through Node.js and, and, it, and it worked pretty well for us. Um, so that's another big why, I suppose, for us. Um, where do you start? How do you, how do you get on this journey? Um, for me, this is the first Lambda that I wrote at Mojo, the Udemy price checker. Um, for you, if you don't know, Udemy is an e-learning site. You can buy sort of tutorials and stuff off. If you take anything away from this talk, it's that you should never pay full price for a Udemy course. Literally, at least once a week, it goes to like 95% off. So I wrote a little Lambda that scraped the website, checked for the course going down to, I think it was under 30 quid. And when it did, it would ping me a Slack notification and, and that was great, I'd go and buy it. Um, I think it was for AWS certifications. I was trying to get everyone certified at the time. Um, 
so yeah, that's kind of where I started. And this was very much a, a thing that I then brought to the team and said, look, I've wrote this little bit of code and I very quickly deployed it into production. Um, so uh, that's, I, I'm assuming there's a chat going on. Anyway, um, that's kind of uh, how I sort of introduced the team to the concept. Um, yeah, slowly but surely, but yeah, actually hurry up. If anyone's ever working for me, they know I'm, I'm relatively impatient. Um, I like to get things done quick, but this is definitely something that you're not going to do that quick um, if you're already sort of unless you're greenfield um, you pretty much need to work quite slowly at this and figure out how to do it as you go along um, the way the approach that we sort of took to it was whenever we were building anything new we'd ask ourselves okay could this be serverless could this be a lambda and a lot of the time the answer to that was yes so we built it as a serverless application and you sort of start to naturally phase out um, the code that you have running on servers and you spend some time then migrating them, but you know, don't down tools and expect that, you know, in a few weeks you're going to go from running servers to being serverless. It's just not a thing. Um, so take your time at it and just do it as it, as it feels natural, I suppose. Uh, get everyone on board. I mean, pretty obvious one, but it is quite important that your team are up for this. This is going to be a serious shift in how you develop software, or how your team develops software. And um, they've got to understand the reasons why you're doing it and pretty much like back you on it. And um, that goes for your stakeholders as well. This is going to require some, well, quite a significant amount of de development effort. It's probably going to slow you down in the initial. Obviously, you'll find the speed benefits coming out the back of it but you gotta get the stakeholders on board with the fact that you're gonna take this quite drastic technical shift. Um, usually telling them that it's gonna be cheaper helps quite a lot. Um, we cannot talk about serverless without talking about the serverless framework. This will literally be your best friend and has been mine for quite a while. If you are developing serverless applications, you know, I spoke a little bit earlier about developer experience and how we get stuff into production. I can literally write a one line CLI command and deploy my JavaScript into a, a production account with an API gateway in front of it. And actually I might throw an S3 bucket on there as well. A couple of bits of script and it's all just sitting there. It's great for local development as well. Serverless offline, they've got lots of plugins, but serverless offline has to be one of my favorites. You can just sort of spin up an actual realistic Lambda and start to debug it there on your machine as if it was running within AWS. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're going to start moving towards a, a, a more serverless oriented architecture, definitely, definitely check out the serverless framework. Um, does it make sense? I think this is a question that you've got to ask yourself quite often. Um, we, we're all going to harp on quite a bit about serverless tonight, but ultimately it is not the answer to everything. Um, the, there are definitely scenarios where it's not the right choice. Um, and you've got to ask, ask yourself quite often, you know, should I be doing this in a serverless way? Um, you know, generally, every time we're going to build something new, a lot of the time the answer is yes, but it's not always. And even if as a company, you know, should you even start down this path of going serverless, potentially not, it might not make sense for you. And there's lots of reasons why that's the case. Um, so yeah, I would often ask that question because everything shouldn't be serverless. Definitely, definitely not. So how have we done? Um, obviously we've been on this journey for well, about a year and a half, maybe just over. Um, so last year, January, 2019, we're running about 15 EC2 instances. So big physical servers that we had to manage and care about and, and love. Um, today, we are running zero EC2 instances. It's actually been that long since I've been in EC2 that I got a nice little welcome message, which was cool. Um, today, our infrastructure looks a bit more like this. We've got 110 lambdas running in production. We've got 16 Fargate instances running there as well. Does that make us 100% serverless? Debatable. Um, I, yeah, I mean, although AWS sells Fargate as a serverless thing, I, I don't personally agree. I think there's lots of elements of it that make it serverless, um, but there's also lots of elements that don't really. Um, there's probably a talk just about that, so I'm not gonna harp on about it too much, but feel free to ask me any questions. Um, and yeah, I mean, I suppose I pretty much don't regret much. Um, it was absolutely the right choice for us to sort of move towards this. We are now running for cheaper, um, we have a great developer experience in terms of the way that we deploy code, very, very streamlined CI, CD process that makes it super, super quick for us to, to kind of get things into the wild. Um, and ultimately we do have less complicated infrastructure and more people can work on that infrastructure 
uh, with a smaller barrier to entry, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much me. Questions, if there are any. There was something going on in the chat while I was speaking here. Yeah, you, you're you getting a little bit rinsed, to be honest with you, mate. Um, <laughs> Ma 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 Martin's in now, so, uh, you know, that's it, you're getting it. But, um, in fact, first question does come from Martin. Um, obviously, you've made us all aware about your thoughts on costs, right? So, Martin's question is, how do you stop the cost spiraling out of control when non-transactional code is written in infrastructure that is charged by consumption? How are you trying to... Um... It's very, very hard to spend more on Lambda than on actually having a physical server. Very, very, very hard. Um, you would literally have to be running it quite constantly and have a lot of them running at the same time. So when I spoke earlier about, yeah, this might not be the answer to everything, that's probably one of the times that um, it, you might, it might not make sense because there is probably a scenario where cost will actually be greater on a serverless application than on a server. I would argue that it's not very often, but there will be those scenarios. That's probably one of the times that you, you maybe shouldn't actually go with a serverless application. Okay. Um, Ryan's asked a question. I don't know if you can see that. Um, what are some of the things that you try to determine when deciding serverless versus not serverless? Um, I think what I've just said is probably quite a key one. Um, speed's obviously one as well. You know. Lambdas do come along with cold start times and stuff like that. Obviously, there are ways to get around that. But if you need super performant applications that um, you know, you're not willing to have an extra 600 milliseconds or whatever it is on a cold start time, um, probably not the right idea. Technology choice as well. There are certain technologies that, uh, well, you can't use on Lambda, but there's also certain ones that don't work as well. For example, if you're using Java, it doesn't work very nicely with uh, Lambda. It does work quite well, but uh, cold start times are a big implication, similar with .NET, although it's better these days. Um, so technology choice and um, scale, I suppose they're kind of the main things for me, really, um, when I'm sort of asking that question to myself. Cool, okay. Um, Bob's got a question for you as well. Um, what, was a sh what was shared between your existing serverful apps and your fancy new lambdas? Um, how did you peel off pieces of functionality? What was shared, what was shared? I think we basically started to, um, I mean, we, we had pretty much pretty chunky APIs that just had lots of roots on them. And as we were sort of working on those things or we had to maintain them, we probably start to chunk them away. So kind of root by root, you know, every root was kind of doing an isolated thing. Um, not a lot of uh, shared, shared code between them. Where that was the case, we'd sort of chunk that off. Um, but to be brutally honest, some of the stuff that we had running on servers is still pretty much running on servers. It's just been transferred over to Docker containers running on Fargate. So that's why we still have 16 Fargate instances running there because actually, it doesn't make enough sense for us to kind of just rebuild those things or migrate those things over. Also, a lot of them are in .NET and our technology of choice for Lambda is Node.js. So I don't want to have to rewrite a load of .NET into Node.js and, and that's kind of, it just makes more sense to have them sitting around. Um, but yeah, that's, I suppose, kind of how we went about it. Cool. Right, good questions, guys. Um, I'm sure there'll be more as the evening goes on. Um, I think we just got another one here from Martin. It's not really a question. No. That's cool. Um, right. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mark. Appreciate that, mate. Um, good cool. as always. Um, Adrian, um, what's in your crystal ball, mate? Tell us about the future of serverless. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you. Uh, yeah, exactly. What could possibly go wrong with this talk, right? This this one is is going to age like milk, right? I mean, this is this is the one where I'm going to going to make the predictions and it could all go terribly wrong. Um, so enjoy my suffering if it goes wrong, uh, please do. Um, so, uh, you know, as an industry, I think what, why have we ended up with serverless in the first place? It's all about, for me, the, uh, the Toyota production systems, seven wastes. You might have seen it as Tim Wood transport, uh, which isn't really much of a problem in lockdown. Although I am in an office today for the first time in four months, I've actually come in for a meeting, which is really weird. There's like sticky notes and stuff that I didn't write. Uh, inventory, like when you build up a, a set of changes in a, in, a, in a branch, you don't merge it. It's kind of building up a waste. Uh, motion doing repetitive manual processes. We've kind of been automating those, right? As, as that's kind of what DevOps is all about. Waiting, we've 
if you're waiting for a build or if you're waiting for approval for a, for a deployment or, or a test environment to be made. We've done a lot of work as an industry around making things go faster. Uh, over production, building features no one uses or, or, or making a massive product backlog. We've done a lot of work in the kind of product development space there to, to think about ways to deal with that. And uh, over processing, which is probably a classic use case of uh, where you've set up a Kubernetes cluster to run a website, a static website, that would be an example of perhaps of overproduction. And the uh, defects when your kind of reliability means that a five minute outage is suddenly turned into hours of, of recovery effort. So I think reduction of waste is the driving force behind things like DevOps and, and ultimately what led us to the cloud, because as you start wanting to get things shipped faster, then at some point you decide, well, actually, let's um, let's use the cloud instead because it's faster than working with our internal uh, IT teams or because we need to scale faster or we, or we need, uh, you know, we don't want to wait for a procurement cycle to happen. And I think ultimately that, that led us to serverless because again, anything that's easier, ultimately you'd like to think as an industry, that's kind of where we're going to end up. So prediction number one straight out of the gate is that the future will be less waste in our processes. Just we will do less wasteful things. Um, I think with serverless, we are this is the gartner hype cycle right so this is this is gartner's kind of view of every technology goes on a cycle like this and i think we've i think we've been through the tr uh, the, the trough of disillusionment now on serverless where people have come across things like vpc cold starts and other rough edges and they kind of become used to you know where serverless fits in things and a few of the rough edges have been taken away so i think the future is productivity you know people just using it you're not going to see people get really excited about serverless uh, i don't think it's kind of well understood as an industry but we're actually still in the early in a, uh, the early adopters phase i would say we're probably a little bit past the innovation you know lambda's been around for a long time people are, are doing a lot of serverless apps i think at infinity works about a third of our projects that we're, what we're doing right now are, are serverless so um I mean, obviously the nature of our work means that we're doing a lot of new builds, so we're kind of not representative of, of tech as a whole, but the future is definitely a greater adoption of serverless. Um, so I think CICD is still a pain point. So, you know, uh, Mark touched on, hey, I can write one line, I can do, you know, serverless deploy and out pops my, uh, you know, a CloudFormation template and it deploys it into AWS and it's super easy and all the rest of it. But actually to do cross account deployments, um, you know, if you've got like a production account, a non-production account, uh, you know, you don't want to give your build server like administrative access over your AWS account. There's still quite a bit of, um, you know, there's a few moving pieces in that kind of state. So the kind of new movers in the serverless uh, world, like Netlify, or, although Netlify has been around for a while, um, it's got really great CI CD from the get go. You kind of start from CI CD and then you build uh, from that point on. And I think that's kind of more of the future. You can see that in AWS's new command line interface for uh, ECS, the, the Docker uh, stuff in, in AWS called a Copilot. And that creates a CI CD pipeline for you as part of the uh, part of the setup. And uh, Netlify CI CD has like previews and uh, for branches and split testing and stuff like that. And I just think, I think the future is that it's, it's CI CD built into the tooling as a first class citizen right from the get go. We've got a Kurosawa theme going on, in case you're wondering. These are, um, so uh, this used to be a picture of a severed arm because we wanted to talk about arm processes, but my wife said to include a picture of a severed arm uh, was inappropriate, so I, I removed it. She's probably right. Um, but I don't really care what, what chip my functions run on, but AWS really does because for them, arm is more power efficient and power ultimately turns into heat in a data center, and that's the bulk of data center costs. Um, so in a couple of years, the Mac I use day to day is probably going to be running an ARM chip. That seems to be the direction that Apple are going. But and you think, well, that's in a few years. But actually, today, most of the code from that my customers, um, you know, most of the, the most of my customers are using ARM powered mobile devices to access the, to run the JavaScript that I'm writing on x86 today. So it's not actually that much of a leap. So the future is serverless functions are going to run on ARM, and it's probably going to be the default because it's probably going to be cheaper for the cloud providers to run it. Um, this is Lord Hidetora, who current, uh, who looks in this picture like how I feel when my build fails because I've incorrectly incorrectly indented my YAML. Um, I think I think all of us as a, as a collective have a, a collective hatred of YAML. I don't like it. You don't get decent auto completion. And then what makes it worse is if you try and graft a programming language onto it. Uh, like cloud formation so you've got the worst thing you've got a horrible kind of configuration language with a with a horrible kind of programming language thing grafted onto it and uh, even 
the comparatively wonderful HashiCorp HCL, HashiLang, people call it, that's gradually turning into a programming language too. It's added for loops, it's got variables and other bits and pieces. You know, it's gonna end up, all of these configuration languages end up being a programming language. Uh, API Gateway and AppSync use Apache VTL, which is horrific. Um, this is definitely not the future. So the future is not these horrible configuration languages. Um, the future is code. So if you look, if you if you try that using Cloudflare workers, um, they uh, they use JavaScript and it is wonderful, a wonderful experience. Um, and yeah, so oh yeah, and Step Functions uses JSON to create if statements. That's also a terrible idea. The future is not this stuff. The future is code, and it's it's always been code, and it'll continue to be code. And uh, Pulumi and AWS CDK are on the right track. Um, and AWS is starting to pull away things like the Apache VTL and listen to kind of customer feedback on that one. So I think the future is code. Um, so Martin's asked, have you tried Pulumi? Uh, haven't tried it, had a good look at it. You know, it looks, it looks like it's the right direction. Um, so Kubernetes, MySQL, MongoDB, Kafka and Redis are not the future. So another, another bold prediction. <laughs> um, even the managed service versions of them, where they've had, you know, where Amazon does this thing where they get something that's open source and popular, they they graft, they take the front off it and sort of bolt it onto some Amazon backend infrastructure. Um, that's not serverless either. That's not where serverless is headed. You know, all these things that were born in the on-premises world like this will never be as cost effective as the serverless uh, companions, the things that were built to run effectively at scale in the cloud. Um, so I think these services have their place as a sort of transition, um, but that's definitely not the future. The future of serverless is to stick with the with the truly serverless services, things like S3, DynamoDB, SQS, and EventBridge. So sorry for the color blast, uh, I sort of. Uh, but here's my take on the, um, the spectrum of serverless in the sort of AWS side of things. So on on the red hand side, you've got classic and on-premises. On the right hand side, you've got the kind of serverless services. So there's a kind of spectrum. Things like uh, ECS and, and Fargate, they're they're sort of they're not quite serverless. You still because the the way that you interact with them is is definitely serverful. You still need uh, you know in terms of the operations people that you have and the operations work, you've got more to do. The skills that you need are, are slightly more specialist. And I think the future of of serverless is about generalism. This idea of people being able to do more things because you're kind of making it simpler to do it. Um, and the cost model is the key kind of difference around there. It's about uh, a server with a, with a particular uh, sort of scale factor or, or kind of consumption size, whereas you're talking uh, about sort of uh, throughput and scaling in the in the serverless world. So I think the future is away from all that stuff, and the future is moving to the right. And I don't think we're going to go back to those things on the left. Um, in AWS, we've got those functions that scale concurrently, but we've still got to do RAM allocation. And I think. I think it's fair to say that as your functions aren't really very serverless at all, you're essentially running uh, a container and you still have to think about CPU utilization and concurrency if you do the sort of um, the, the different consumption mode, the reserve consumption mode. Um, I don't think that's cool. I think surely you should just be able to set a limit and the cloud provider should work it out, an absolute limit, and, they, and they'll, they'll do the rest, right? And so I think the feature is that cloud providers will just scale that stuff for us and we don't even have to think about uh, RAM allocation uh, the other things, I think all those limits are, are, are going to go. Um, okay. I think in a few years, Kubernetes will be a, about as appealing as Oracle Web Logic is today. Um, I think we'll wonder why we thought it was a good idea to run such a complex set of stuff. Um, you know, we've got things like Fargate and, and GCP's Cloud Run, which are kind of more on the serverless end, but still a bit containery. But I think we're going to see a complete blur in our line where you can just run a standard container in a serverless way. I'm not sure who's going to do it first. Um, you know, where you, you know, it's never going to be as fast as a serverless function because there's just, you know, if you look at the size of a, of a, of a normal Docker image, it's, it's typically got a few hundred megabytes of various dependencies uh, to drag along, whereas a Lambda function has a max zip file size of 50 megs. So you kind of, you know, you can't compare the two scales. So you, you start at times always going to be slower. But um, you know, maybe the future is is the past after all, right? Maybe 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 containers will have a sort of a renaissance moment and somehow come back. I, I used Fly.io um, a, a week or so ago to give that a try. It's like a, it's probably the best developer experience I've seen for for containers. Uh, it was really really slick. So I think uh, and things like the ECS Copilot are really really killing it in terms of developer experience. But you know, I don't think it's the future over a longer term. So, so this is a sad moment for me when I think about SQL databases. 
Um, I used them non-stop for, for about 15 years, but I haven't actually used one for transactional data in about four years now of, of building new projects. I've pretty much used DynamoDB consistently now for the last four four years of, of building new projects. And that's things like a, a pharmacy that's doing over a million prescriptions a month, um, a gambling company that has a million users on a Saturday, a telecoms company building a fiber network across the UK, and, and a retailer that's selling really high value items. So a kind of wide range of, of different projects, but DynamoDB has been capable of delivering for all of those things. Um, I think the problem with SQL is, you know, not only do you need then a network and a whole bunch of other stuff that goes along with running a, a kind of traditional database, but you get into the kind of scaling problems where a query works great until, until it doesn't work great and, and the performance drops through the roof. I'm sure that maybe things like CockroachDB or Spanner can produce kind of this horizontal scalability that we're looking for, but today, um, I'm not sure what I would go for. And in fact, um, I'll, I'll talk about why there's other reasons why that's never going to happen. So the future is no SQL. But what about all the reports that I, uh, that I need? Well, we've got data lakes. Um, so in my, in my current project, there's about seven, there's seven squads, each writing uh, lightweight microservices as Lambda functions. Each microservice has its own DynamoDB database so each, each one has its own sort of uh, individual database it uses a sort of event sourced design in, in dynamo and each service is publishing json messages via event bridge for other services to subscribe to and, and handles asynchronously which has allowed for all like all of those teams to work independently on different sections of the user journey but what happens is that uh, all of the messages get streamed out via kinesis into a into a data lake and we're using uh, snowflake to provide our sort of enterprise-wide reporting across the across the uh, across all of those services. You probably just saw it IPO for a sort of crazy amount of billions uh, uh, today. I think it was I think it was 220 billion or something like that. Um, but yeah, these this is a sort of serverless BI platform that allows you to uh, scale up, like scale up your uh, BI platform transparently, and, and you just kind of consume. Uh, credits. It's a uh, sort of a bit like a Athena, but um, a more advanced version of, of Athena. They'd probably hate it if I if they heard me saying such a thing. They'd probably be crying. I'm sure it does a lot. I'm probably massively underselling it. Um, but the far future might be real-time streaming analytics. But uh, tools like Snowflake and Athena are really doing the job for me right now. They're allowing me to have confidence that I can use a, a, a database like DynamoDB, which is relatively uh, primitive, I suppose, in some respects. But I can still get the data out that I, that I need and, and still query across um, all of the team's data and so on. Um, so, looking again, looking out the, to the landscape, uh, Netlify has had $100 million of investment and Vercel has had $21 million. So Vercel used to be called uh, ZEIT or Z-E-I-T. Um, you might know them as the creators of the Next.js uh, framework. Um, what do they both have in common? They both run on AWS. So Netlify and Vercel are there for hosting uh, essentially static and uh, sort of and serverless functions are, and they both run on top of AWS. So they, they, they deliver that function capability without you having your own AWS account. So one way you could look at this is that the friction, the hassle of dealing with just even setting up an AWS account and managing it is that you can get, you can start up a company and grow it to a hundred million of investment uh, from, from other people. I mean, God knows what the valuation is then for those companies, just because it's a hassle to deal with AWS. So, you know, Maybe, you know, computing has been a utility since the 1960s, right? You've been able to do a kind of time sharing system and this idea of computing being a utility that you can buy into. Um, maybe this is it because, you know, I don't, <clears throat> I don't buy my power from a power station. Maybe it's okay to just use Netlify and uh, sort of take that abstraction away. Maybe that's the future. Um, the other thing is there's surprising places where functions are just showing up these serverless functions. The landscape is bigger than we think. Um, so I, I set up my first Cloudflare worker in January, which was great and uh, and really easy to do. And, you know, you just use some JavaScript instead of having to do sort of uh, anything complicated, no complications around regions and stuff. But companies like Segment.io are building serverless functions into their analytics platform. So you can push an event and then trigger a bunch of actions off the back of um, off the back of a user action in the front end. So there's a lot of work going around. You know, essentially what we're doing now is we're building 
a bunch of complicated JavaScript, shoving it to uh, 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 basically building an application in the browser. And then that's interacting with various backend services. So, you know, some places are you're interacting with directly with S3, like uh, to, to create pre-signed URLs or you're, or you're even interacting directly with Kinesis to push analytics streaming events, or you're interacting directly with um, new, new databases like FaunaDB directly from inside the browser. You're not kind of building your own backend. And uh, this is a sort of, there's a, there's a, a case here where you're saying, well, actually, if something's just happened, uh, maybe I could trigger that from, from segments. There's a whole bunch of other integrations here. So we've made use of things like the Zendesk integration to push information to uh, customer support teams about what's going on on the website, those kind of things, kind of interesting. So maybe the feature of this is niche serverless platforms that focus on these specific use cases, but you're going to be able to extend them with these with custom functions. And maybe those functions are just Lambda functions running in an AWS account owned by that niche provider, but you're kind of building, you're starting to see serverless leach into, into the product space. And I think that's a good thing. Um, so the niche providers though are not filling out the full stack of stuff you need to build like uh, most apps. So this is kind of where I think of pretty much everything I need to build something, uh, you know, the kind of things that I build at least, you need some kind of gateway for doing HTTP. You need some kind of function, some kind of code, something that runs in, in response to an event, uh, some kind of tabular storage system, a blob storage thing, a QE thing, and perhaps a stream. Maybe you've got one thing that can do both a queue and a stream, um, some kind of thing for doing workflows and a data lake kind of thing. And I think that's most of what I need to build uh, a lot of kind of business to consumer experiences or, or B2B integration work. It, it, there's not a great deal that you need to, to do there. Um, one thing that I got thinking about here is that this, but the, the, the niche providers don't have CloudTrail, IAM, all the security tools that you really need to satisfy kind of in-depth security auditing. So, that, so it's kind of the in-depth security auditing is not going to get passed on these niche providers, but um, so maybe, the, maybe they've not got a future. But I was thinking that I'm already using GitHub serverless compute offering today. Um, I use GitHub Actions and it's brilliant and it's got a great ecosystem around it. Um, I'm paying for minutes of compute time on, on GitHub Actions. I also use their serverless uh, static website hosting and I've been using that for a few years now. Um, maybe the future is them adding a database and the serverless function runtime. Maybe GitHub or Microsoft's sort of weird side bet, who knows? Um, but yeah, so there's another problem with this whole thing though about this idea of niche providers is that the transaction cost and friction of getting any kind of software as a service contract in place, the network latency, bandwidth and all the other stuff, the secret management hassle of API keys. Um, I think if your cloud provider does something that's roughly what you need, you're basically going to use it unless it's really, really, really bad. It would have to be pretty terrible for you not to use it. Um, and I think if you make a standout product, you're essentially, um, a cloud provider will just make their own version. That's not, that's good enough. It doesn't have to be as good as your product. It just has to be good enough that you don't bother to use the other product because you've got to set up some extra contracts and you've got some other friction in place. You've got to set up some payments. You've got to do some monitoring of it. It's just this extra hassle. So, um, you know, they're going to, they're going to do that. Um, and I think my, my take on this is that if you select a cloud vendor and then try and be cloud not cloud agnostic on it. It's like buying a house, parking a camper van outside. And then, you know, eventually you're going to go in and use the toilet. You know, that's going to happen. And then you're probably going to go, you think, well, actually I could do with putting this in the oven. You're probably going to use the kitchen. So you might as well just move in and just enjoy the house that you've, uh, that you've, that you've, you've bought. So I think, I think the future is not really worrying about the walled garden that you're in. It's just, you know, sit in it and uh, just get on with building things. So I think, that's the, uh, that's the future. And that's, that's me. <clears throat> Love that Adrian. Um, thank you very much for that. We have had a couple of questions come through. Um, question from Martin, Adrian. Um, do, you, do you think your serverless prediction is specific to a certain set of user, uh, users or organizations? I don't know. I mean, I work across a lot of different uh, industry sectors, but you know, I'm not, you know, but of course I'm, I'm kind of like a self-selecting group. I'm only ever going to see, see the world through, through, I guess my experience, you know, is it, is it, it's, it's a difficult one to say that one. I mean, obviously there's a sort of strong tendency to the web. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a push in financial services to, to retain 
containers because there's this sort of feeling of um, being able to migrate, even though you've built like huge swathes of Terraform that are sort of uh, cloud provider specific, there's still this idea that, you know, that the code is relatively portable, um, that kind of thing. I'm not, I'm not convinced um, by it, but uh, let me think, is, is my prediction specific? Service list will be all organizations. I think I think it's inexorable. I think I think we'll end up there. I think it is just the way that it will go. In fact, I think it's more likely that we'll end up with when you build a new framework for something, a new open source framework, you'll build the SaaS that goes along with it, the software as a, I think I think it'll get to the point where you develop a tooling and the service are kind of completely intertwined, much like next.js and, and Vercel. I think that'll be the I think that's the way of things. Cool. Um, I mean, I just want to agree with what Manny Potter's just put there about loving that cloud agnostic analogy about the camper van and the house. I mean, to be honest with you, that brought it all together for me, to be honest with you, because I was thinking, what's he on about? And that, <laughs> that, that, that has really just kind of pull it into context for me. So that's brilliant. Um, okay, a question from Mark. Um, don't know why he's not just asked you, to be honest with you, but do you think cloud providers <laughs> are going to stay broad or focus on niche areas? I think I think they're addicted to broadness. I think cloud providers are, are mostly about enterprise sales, aren't they? Uh, now, so I think there's always going to be like there's, enterprise sales is always about you know listening to those customers. Those those customers have the edge case. You know, why have we got a man? Why why did AWS create a managed Kafka? I mean, presumably because it's blocking somebody from uh, from migrating their legacy workload onto AWS, or it's a or it would help customers to run more effectively in AWS, and it would and not managing that would be a, a good thing for customers. So I think they're always going to be supporting those uh, those broad things. AWS don't really switch things off in the same way that perhaps other cloud providers do. So they're going to be supporting that legacy for a long time. So I think I think uh, the cloud providers on the whole are going to stay broad. But I think what will happen is we'll have a bunch of new startups that form niche areas. Um, and I think there's a market for that. I think a secondary market for cloud services. Yeah, that's reasonable. Cool. Right, Adrian, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. I know that's extremely insightful. Um, now, when we typically do the more physical events, what we like to do is kind of bring the three speakers together um, and just basically let the... Uh, let the attendees uh, abuse you and ask you loads of questions. Um, now that's going to be a little bit difficult given the situation. Um, but if there is any more questions, obviously Bob went first, and you know I get it, people are a bit nervous. Mark went second. So if there is any more questions for the group, um, you're all very very respectful people. You've kept yourselves on mute. Um, I, you know I open up to to all of you to kind of ask your questions. Um, Martin, you look raring to go. Look at that smirk. Yeah, always is. Cool, he is. <laughs> he, he's, I don't think he knows he's on mute. This is brilliant. <laughs> I tell you what, actually, we've just had a question come in uh, from from Hiran. Um, what's your favourite serverless serv uh, service? Um, so we'll go to Bob first with that. Um, it's a tough one. Um, I've got three which is a cop out isn't it um i think the simplicity <laughs> s3 is hard to beat i think it's great i think dynamo is an incredible bit of engineering um i like dynamo an awful lot um i actually think that event bridge is probably the most important serverless service since lambda um because obviously i come from this kind of event driven architecture background i think that event driven architecture helps you to build uh, more interesting systems and event bridge is an enabler of that in a way that kind of sqs or sns wasn't Mark? Yeah, I, oh, I've, I've got a love, I've got a love hate thing with Eventbridge. So, like, I, I, I'm using it, and you know, it, it's great. But you don't get a lot of control over the over the retry behavior. So it's kind of it retries uh, with exponential back off for up to 24 hours. But if you plugged it into a lambda, uh, you actually only get uh, three attempts. If your lambda crashes three times, then it doesn't retry it. So there's a couple of kind of rough edges on on, on the on the event bridge to lambda integration that I think could be could be tidied up. So but yeah it's a it's a great service. Um, I think I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with uh, Lambda. It's just you know it's just great. Like the ability to just run code thousands, you know, across thousands of uh, of servers uh, you know really cheaply. I think it's great. I think it's a brilliant idea. Yep. I think uh, probably step functions for me. I think the ability to sort of really quickly and easily build workflows, which 
historically has just been an absolute nightmare to do um, in an entirely serverless way is just a great thing. Obviously that encompasses Lambda, which is, you know, a, a brilliant little tool, but um, yeah, right now step functions, I'm using it quite a bit these days. So i um, got to go with that. But, but surely you hate the step functions language. It, yeah, I mean, it's not the nicest thing to put together, but what it actually does when it comes out of the box is pretty neat. Yeah, I think it'd be, oh, I think it'd be great yeah. to see a DSL for that, a, a domain-specific language for for that. Or, you know, could you not just compile your JavaScript into uh, into TypeScript, def, in, you know, into uh, into states language? You have a sort of subset of JavaScript. That would be that would be awesome. Mm. Yeah. The amount of problems we had doing that, um, the serverless step function thing for. Um, my last place was, uh, as I'm sure your people will attest to, Adrian. Um, that was an absolute nightmare trying to get that working in CloudFormation. Yeah, just don't use CloudFormation though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's crap. Come up the entire session with use serverless <laughs> use CloudFormation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> use use Terraform and serverless framework. One of the uh, big things we, we try to get out of Digital North, although it's all about talking about technology, um, you know, sharing war stories, showing each other your battle scars, it's, it's also about learning. Um, and Alex has uh, dropped a note on here. And I feel like this is a bit of an opportunity for Bob to sell his book or multiple books. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. Is Alex your co-author? I think <laughs> Alex, is, Alex is on commission, I think. But... Uh, Alex has asked what resources or, or books, um, Bob, um, would the speakers recommend as an introduction to the key ideas and components of serverless? I'm sure a few people would like to know that. Yeah, um, I can't recommend my book for people who want to know about serverless. Um, I'm not, not going to uh, try and flog it at something it's not. Um, it is about vendor and architecture, if you like that. Um, for me, actually, my, the biggest source of information for me is Twitter. Um, there is a thriving serverless community on Twitter. Uh, a lot of kind of AWS uh, solutions architects and serverless heroes just talking and th because they're all sort of at the boundary of what we know about how to build interesting systems. There's just a lot of people talking about the problems that they've got and trying to find solutions to them. So yeah, I think Twitter is honestly the best place to learn about serverless at the moment. Guys in agreement, are you? I would say I would suggest um, actually doing the um, AWS Developer Associate exam is a really good way to learn about it. Yeah. Um, because if you do the AWS sort of solutions architect kind of track, that takes you into a lot of sort of uh, enterprise stuff around you know how to how to do deal with Oracle and how to do uh, you know VPNs and all that kind of stuff. But the developer one is really focused on uh, on Lambda and it touches on things like blue green deploys on Lambda, Lambda versioning, um, and a whole bunch of uh, of serverless type stuff. So I, I would say actually doing the the DevOps certification or you know going down that track, the developer and maybe the DevOps pro, so it would be a good move. Um, I think the other thing is serverless changes really, really fast. So, I mean, you know, you've got to remember AWS is releasing what they, they famously sort of do like 2000 product updates uh, a year and have done for the last two years. So kind of what you knew about serverless a few years ago is probably wrong. So it's really hard to sort of print a book about it, I think. You in agreement, Mark? Yeah, I think that's a great shout, actually. A certification is a great way to really just get an overarching um, idea of the concept. Um, don't pay full price for the tutorial on Udemy, though. Um, <laughs> uh, what's that, sorry? What's your affiliate code for Udemy? <laughs> <laughs> I should really have one, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, like, I, I get a lot of value out of Medium these days. It's, it's learned me quite well, and love it or hate it, I get quite a lot of uh, targeted articles every morning to wake up to, and, and they're generally um, around serverless because I spend a lot of time reading about it. So, you know, to Adrian's point of everything you read two years ago is probably out of date. If you, if you can keep up to date with sort of articles that are going on around that ecosystem. And um, yeah, Medium for me is a great one, really. Good stuff. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, look, I think it's probably time just to kind of round this off. Um, what I'd say is after this, I would invite the, the three speakers to maybe kind of hang around and maybe the guys that are still hanging about to ask some more questions. Um, but I think as far as I'm concerned, I'd just like to thank the three of you on behalf of Digital North and the attendees for 
for being here this evening, taking your own time out of your day. Um, so thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, obviously, thank you to the attendees. You've all been extremely respectful of your microphones on mute. Uh, so greatly appreciated. Um, as a part of our kind of progression with Digital North, feedback is so important. You know, we want to put on good events, get good content, good, good uh, get good speakers involved. Um, and like I say, you know, we want to cultivate this environment um, that enables people to learn, right? That's ultimately the most important thing. So um, thank you again to everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, and yeah, hopefully see you at the next event. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for putting it together. No worries, mate. Thank you.